Well, thank you so much for joining us for worship service today. Before we get into God's word for today, let's unite our hearts together in prayer, asking the Lord for his help as we go into his word for today. Father God, we come before you in a spirit of humility and Lord, with so much joy in our hearts. We thank you for the great opportunity and the great privilege that it is to get into your word and to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts directly, Lord, that I wouldn't get in the way of your message, but Lord, that your message which does not go forth from your mouth and return to you empty, but always accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. Lord, that you would do it for our hearts and our minds and transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ today. And it says, in his name we pray, amen. Now, in order to begin this message, I want to ask you a quick question. And that question is, with which eye do you see the world with more? If you do have two working eyes, which eye is more dominant? Now, it's really important to know which is your dominant eye for many reasons. But one reason is, if you're going to play basketball and you're left-handed or left eye, then you should be left-handed. You should shoot the ball with your left hand. It's not something they taught me or probably Lonzo Ball or local product here, a prodigy from around here. And so he, like, like I, we are left eye dominant, but we shoot with our right hand. And so we kind of have this strange shot. He's still working on it to this very day. It's not something that they tell you or teach you uh, which eye is dominant. And you might be sitting there right now thinking, I'm not sure which eye is more dominant, but let's figure that out together. And I promise you, this has everything to do with the message for today. But as you're sitting there on the couch, you might need to move more toward the center of the room. Uh, just, But we're going to get some help from our good friend, Bruce Gannigan, right here. And so with two hands, you need two hand, both your hands, go ahead and, and make a little bit of a hole with both hands and place the soccer ball right there, right in the center of that hole. Make sure your head is straight, and we're going to determine which of your two eyes is the dominant eye. And so with that soccer ball right in the middle of the hole right there, go ahead and close your left eye. Now, if that ball is no longer in the center of the circle, that means you are left eye dominant and vice versa. And if there's a person in your room, go ahead and tell them which eye is more dominant after you figure out if you're left eye dominant or more right eye dominant. And isn't that interesting that we all see the world not with two eyes equally, but either with your left eye more so or the left eye. And it's really interesting, and some scientists even say that if you're left eye dominant, then that means you actually use the left side of your brain more, and so you're more of an analytical person, and you like math and science and being objective. And if you are right eye, then actually then you enjoy music, and you're more creative, and you dress in creative ways. And I'm not sure if that's all true, because we do have that corpus callosum, which makes the two sides of our brain into one brain. I don't know if that's true, but one thing is for sure, we do see the world through one eye more so than the other. And in the Bible, we're going to be looking at different passages that God teaches us that we actually see the world through our two different spiritual eyes that we have, and one of them is more dominant. If you are a true believer, if you've heard the gospel and you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then you have these two spiritual eyes, but you actually see the world more so through one eye than the other. Even though we see it through both eyes, we see one more than the other. So the first thing that we're going to see in our passages for today is we're taking a little bit of a break from our series in Romans. The th first thing that we're going to see is what are these two spiritual eyes that we have anyways? What are those two eyes? Now, the second thing that we're going to be seeing for today is have you actually asked the Lord to strengthen, to give you this um, special eye, this spiritual, spiritual eye that God gives to us, and do you constantly pray and ask the Lord to strengthen that eye, your quote-unquote right eye. Now, the third thing that we're going to be seeing for today is how do we apply all of this? It's really interesting that we have two different spiritual eyes, but what does it all matter? Well, you need to know that God really wants you to use, especially your right eye, quote-unquote right eye. And so we'll see how to do that, how he wants us to use our spiritual eye, but also how we can use it for the Lord and for his glory. And so first, though, let's see what these two eyes are anyways. What are these two eyes? Well, the first eye is your godly, Christ-like eye. 
That's one way to look at it. That's one way to, to, to define this one eye. It's a, our godly, Christ-like eye. And so one passage, we all love the book of Revelation. It's a little bit confusing. Um, but one passage is clear, and that word, that's where it talks about Jesus' spiritual eye, the eyes of the Lord that he actually gives to us. So turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. And this is what it says. It says, this is the Apostle John, and he's looking into heaven. He doesn't see heaven directly, but he sees this vision of, he of heaven with symbols there. And this is what he says. He says, Then I saw a lamb. Now that's a lamb with a capital L. Then I saw a lamb. That's the Lord Jesus Christ looking as if it had been slain. This represents the fact that Jesus suffered and died on the cross. He was crucified for us standing at the center of the throne. Now, notice that according to literal translations of the Bible, he's not sitting or standing somewhere in the throne room, but he's actually on the throne, and he's there, of course, because he is the king. He's the king of kings. It's his throne. Standing on the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, the 24 elders, which represents the church. And it goes on and says, the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all of the earth. Now those seven horns, a horn represents power or authority of a ruler. And he has seven of them because seven is a number of fullness or completion, meaning that he has full authority and power, of course, because he is the Lord of Lords and he is the King of Kings. And he has full power more than any king or president on the face of the planet. Now, it gets to the point where we want to talk about, it also says that he has seven eyes. He's got seven eyes. Now, this is not, again, it's not literal. It doesn't have seven eyes literally, but he has seven eyes that's figurative in a symbolic sense for the fact that he sees everything. Uh, seven, again, is a number of completion and fullness. And so he sees everything. He can see beyond appearances. He sees beyond all the lies and the deception that is going on. He can see beyond our lies and deception. He can see directly into our hearts and our minds. He knows exactly what's going on. He sees beyond uh, the government and their cover-ups and, and their lies. He sees beyond that to the deep state, but he can see into the spiritual realm, the spiritual reality. An amazing thing is, is by his grace, he actually wants to give us his eyes, the eyes of the Lord. These godly, Christ-like eyes is a gift for every believer, every true believer who has given their lives to him. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that we see just through that eye. It's just that we have that eye. Now, our other eye, our natural eye, or our worldly eyes are the eyes that everyone has. This is the, the eyes that we see the appearance of things, the outside, the superficiality of things. And so we have both of these two different eyes. Godly Christ-like eyes, but also our natural, fleshly, worldly eyes, which pursue worldly things and are in love with. We desire the things of this world. It's a lust for the things of this world, our two different eyes. And so we could define our godly Christ-like eye, though, as Eyes that see uh, the world beyond appearances. With your godly, Christ-like eyes, you actually see the world beyond the appearances into the spiritual realm and in the way that God sees the world. That's one way of looking at it. With our godly, Christ-like eyes, we get to see the world in the same way that the Lord, that God, that Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that they see the world. Now, one really interesting passage that talks about how we have these two different eyes and how we can use these two different eyes is with the prophet Samuel. And so God called Samuel to find a replacement for King Saul. King Saul had failed the Lord with his sins and his rebellion against God. And so God had already appointed and he knew which was going to be the next king to replace King Saul. Samuel didn't know, but God told Samuel it's going to be one of the sons of this man named Jesse. And so Samuel, the prophet, went to Jesse and said, bring me all of your sons. Jesse brought out seven of his sons. 
And Samuel took a look at the first son and said, oh, this guy is it. He's handsome. You know, he's, he's great looking. He's got a great build. He's powerful and he's smart. He's going to be the next king. I know it. And this is what God, though, God says to Samuel after, God, after Samuel used his worldly, fleshly eyes to find the next king of Israel. God says, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. And he goes on and says, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance with your worldly eyes, but the Lord looks on the heart with the eyes of the Lord. And so the Lord is saying, use your godly Christ-like eyes, Samuel. And so Jesse brings us other sons. He has six more sons that he has before him. And Samuel says one after another, no, it's not this person. He's handsome and he's, he's uh, smart and he's powerful and, and all, but that's not the person that God has chosen. Goes through all his sons and says, Jesse, do you have any more sons? And Jesse said, well, I have one more son, but he's, he's young and he's not that smart right now. He's just a shepherd. He's just a simple shepherd boy. And he can't be the one because he's kind of a he's kind of a wimp right now. He's kind of a weakling. It can't be that one. But Samuel says, bring him here. And it's, of course, David. And Samuel says, this is the one. Using his godly Christ-like eyes, he can see that this is the one who has a heart for the Lord. He's a, a man after God's own heart. He can actually see beyond appearances into his heart and his mind. And he says, this is the one that the Lord has chosen to be the next king of Israel. And so we can use both of our eyes. Now, it's kind of like, if you think about the analogy, it's kind of like if you've ever worn the Oculus, if you've ever used VR glasses, you're in the real physical world, our world, but you're also in this virtual reality kind of world. And sometimes it can get kind of confusing. You forget the real world that you're in and you see this virtual reality world. And here's a young man who is probably covered in spiders, or maybe he has a T-Rex coming after him. Not sure, but this is how he responds. <laughs> and it's not just children who get confused when they're wearing VR glasses, but you see people all the time, uh, they have a T-Rex running after him, or some spaceship aliens coming after him, and so they go running in the opposite direction, run into a wall. Here is one guy who's trying to jump off of a plane. And so he thinks that he's jumping off this plane, probably in order to fly with his squirrel suit. But instead, he jumps in the real world right into a TV. And actually, one of our sons did this, did this exact same thing. He tried to play it off um, by laughing, but then he started crying. And it's pretty painful what you have to go through if you don't see the real world beyond appearances. And it's the same exact way with our two spiritual eyes. We have our worldly, fleshly eyes, which just see the appearances of how things are. But then God gives to us as a gift, out of love for us, he gives us these eyes of Christ, our godly Christ-like eyes that can see beyond that. And God calls us. He asks us and he calls us to use those eyes and those eyes alone in order to see the truth and in order to see the true reality. But the question is, which eye do you usually use? Which eye for you is the most dominant eye? Now, this is not talking anymore about your left eye or the right eye. This is talking about your worldly, your fleshly eye that sees appearances, or do you use your godly Christ-like eye? And if you're sitting there kind of confused, thinking like, I, I don't see the world in two different ways that are completely different. I only see the world through one way. Most likely, you're only seeing the world through your, through our worldly, fleshly eyes, not our godly, Christ-like eyes. But it can be confusing. We, If you have both eyes and you're seeing the world through both eyes, then our, the picture that they give to us, the perspectives are completely different. And it is very confusing to see these two worlds simultaneously. And we have a choice to make then, with which eye are we going to actually see the world? And sadly, sometimes we actually use our worldly eye to see the world, it's much more comfortable. And this is the way that everyone else sees the world. And if we go and see the world with our godly Christ-like eyes, then we see things that sometimes we don't like 
to see. We see the sin and evil in this world. And so which eye, though, is your more dominant eye? Now, you may be sitting there thinking, what does this all matter anyways? I mean, it's very interesting, sure, that we have two different kinds of spiritual eyes. It's very theoretically and hypothetically interesting, but what does it really matter? And this is the reason why it matters, is your two different eyes actually see two completely different paths. Your worldly fleshly eye sees this path toward achievements and success and being popular and loving the leisures and things of this world. That's what your worldly fleshly eye sees. Now your other eye that God has given to all true Christians is the eye that sees this path that's going in a completely different direction. This is a path toward humility, but a love for Jesus and a love for his church and a love for his kingdom, a love for missionaries, a love for missions work and a love for the church and all the things that God love absolutely loves and sees those things in a much greater way. And there's a different path. There's a path of righteousness that really disregards our physical well-being. I mean, it's willing to go outside of our comfort zones to stay on this path. And we as Christians, we, we love to, as American Christians especially, we love to go down both paths at the same time. We want to be successful in this world and have all the luxuries and leisure time of this world, but we also want to be godly and going down the path of righteousness. The problem is that these two paths are going in two completely different directions, and you can't, you can't go down both paths at the same time. Sometimes we try to hop back and forth, and it just makes our lives all the more confusing and troubling, really, filled with problems and anxieties if you try to go down both of these paths which are heading in two different directions at the same time. But that's the reason why it's so important. Our two different eyes see the world in two different ways and they see two different paths going in two opposite directions. And so again, which eye is more dominant for you? I would say for myself growing up, when I was in junior high, high school, elementary school, I became a Christian when I was pretty young, but that eye, that godly Christ-like eye for me was probably pretty weak. In fact, not probably, I know it was pretty weak. The person that I wanted to be like most was not even the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted to be like Bo. I mean, there were other people who wanted to be like Michael. Jackson, Tyson, Jordan, whatever, take your pick. They, a lot of my friends wanted to be like Michael Jordan, play basketball, but I wanted to be like Bo. I wanted to be popular like him. I wanted to be able to play multiple sports. Bo Jackson just looked way more powerful than Michael Jordan, for sure, Jackson, maybe even Tyson, but the best athlete of all time. He could play professional football, baseball, run up walls, and he knew how to surf and play the guitar, uh, at least according to the commercials. And so I wanted to be exactly like Bo. I wanted to be popular and successful like him. Now, if anyone came to me and asked me and said, hey, would you rather be somebody who is persecuted, somebody who is unpopular because of what you believe in your faith in Jesus, but you know that you love Jesus and he's all that matters to you? Would you rather be that person or Bo Jackson? I for sure would have said I would much rather be Bo Jackson. I don't even want to be that guy at all, really, or maybe on Sundays when I'm talking to my youth counselor. But that's about, that's about it. Every day, for the rest of the days, I just want to be like Bo Jackson. And so, you know, for me, I can look at my life and see there are two different paths. And slowly God has actually grown me, as well as most Christians, toward strengthening our godly Christ-like eyes so that we see that path. And we also see the persecution, the trials, and the difficulties, the challenges. It's not an easy life. No one said it's going to be an easy life to walk the path of righteousness with our godly Christ-like eye. It's not easy. And yet that's the path that God wants us to walk along, but to walk with Him. And so that's the first part of our message today, is that we have these two eyes, our godly Christ-like eye and also our worldly eye. The second question is, have you stopped? Have you, have you paused from your life, from your busy life, and simply asked the Lord and said, Lord, would you give me these godly Christ-like eyes and would you strengthen 
my godly Christ-like eye. Help me to see the world as you see the world. This may be painful at times to see the world as you see it, with all of the struggles, with all of the sin, with all of the evil and the deception in this world. Sometimes we like to deceive ourselves and be delusional, but Lord, I just want eyes to see, the eyes that you have. Give me these godly Christ-like eyes, and would you strengthen them on a daily basis? And we also need to pray on the other hand, and Lord, would you also strike me with blindness in my worldly eyes, in my fleshly eyes. Help me not even to see that path. Help me to not even care about that path at all. And a really interesting path uh, passage in the Bible is 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, in which King Solomon asks for this very thing. He asks the Lord for godly Christ-like eyes, and he's an example for us in asking, in Jesus' name, the Lord's name, for these godly Christ-like eyes. And so this is what it says, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, says, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give to you. Now, what Solomon, what's Solomon going to ask him? Well, he says, in verse 7, he says, Lord, give me a discerning heart. Give me literally eyes to see your eyes. Give me your, your wisdom. Give me these godly Christ-like eyes is essentially what King Solomon asked for. Now, what did, what did the Lord do? How did he respond to that? And in verses 10 to 12, it tells us exactly what the Lord God did. It says, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. And so God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth, for yourself, and nor have you asked for death for your enemies. I mean, you, you didn't ask for anything according to your worldly eye for success and for long life and um, treasures and all these things, but instead you asked for wisdom for my eyes, but for discernment and administering justice. I will do what you have asked, and I will give you a wise and discerning heart. That's another way of saying to give you the eyes of the Lord, to give you my eyes, godly Christ-like eyes. And so the question again is, have you just paused from busy life and asked the Lord for these discerning eyes, godly Christ-like eyes, and do you pray on a daily basis for these godly Christ-like eyes? We're going to encounter so many situations throughout each and every day of our lives where we need those discerning eyes, these godly Christ-like eyes, to see God's justice and his path of righteousness. And if we just do whatever we feel like doing, then we're going to use our worldly fleshly eye and head down this path of unrighteousness, which really leads to an eternity of being separated from God. Now let's do a little bit of a test and, and I just want to give an example, an illustration of how we can see the exact same events and people of our lives in two completely different ways, using our two different eyes. And so I'm going to tell you the story of a young man from the time that he was young and the two ways that people look at the same exact person. Now, most of the people see this young boy, we've all heard of him, but most of them see him as a boy who was born uh, in shame, and he was born poor, and his parents were kind of homeless at that time. And really, he was born in shame, according to most people, because he was born out of wedlock. He had a lot of brothers and sisters, but he was probably of darker complexion because his father and he probably worked outside a lot, and so they're in the dark. And especially in that part of the world, they looked down upon people who worked outside, who were darker. But that's how he grew up. But this boy had a lot of potential. He was super smart and very wise, and people had the, the highest hopes for him. He had the greatest potential, and they hoped that one day he would be the governor, or even more than that, that he would be a ruler, maybe a president or a king of their nation, maybe even the world. But sadly, sadly, his career came to an end when he was very young, early 30s. He was actually murdered. He was killed by the government in this conspiracy against him. And so before he could actually do anything to really help the world and to be a powerful leader in his country, uh, his life came to a quick 
and sudden death. And, and that was it. And people do remember him for being a good person. He was good. He helped the poor people. And he was actually uh, somewhat influential. People followed him. And he was a good philosopher, a good teacher. We remember some of his wisdom today. Yeah, but overall, he was just a good guy. And actually, to tell you the truth, using these worldly eyes, his life was somewhat disappointing. He didn't really amount to much. And this is the way that most people see this young man named Yesu. Now, for those of us who use our godly Christ-like eyes, we see his life in a completely different way, as you know. We see him as this person who didn't just have great potential, but he reached much more than anyone's potential beyond whatever anyone could ever imagine. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the King of Kings. And people always ask the question, why didn't the Lord Jesus Christ, why didn't Jesus come now? We have way more problems now than the world had 2,000 years ago. And the reason was by his life, death, and resurrection, he conquered sin, he conquered death, he conquered Satan, conquered evil, he conquered every evil thing, and he gave us a way of eternal life. And that's good for everyone who lived before he uh, was born as a man, God and man, and everyone after as well. And so his gift to us, his blessing to us is eternal. It's timeless. And so you can actually benefit from his life by trusting in him 2,000 years after his life, death, and resurrection from the dead. And he's really all that you need. If Even if you lost everything, if you lost your home, your car, your job, even your family, you could still, under all of the pain and the suffering, the mourn that you're going through, be filled with nothing but eternal joy and satisfaction because you know that he's your king and he's your God and he is all that you need. Now, if we see the Lord Jesus Christ with our uh, Christ-like eyes, our godly Christ-like eyes, then we realize how great and how good and how amazing that he is. But most of us have to look at Jesus and say, you know what? There are some days that I see him with that godly Christ-like eye and I just love him. I want to worship him. But there are other days where I just look at him with my worldly eyes. And I don't think that he was that great. Sure, he had a, a great following and he is my Lord, but I don't really feel like worshiping him. And I really just want him to do for me what I want. I don't want to seek his will. I want him to do for me. And so we even look at the Lord Jesus Christ with two different eyes at the same time. And so we need to pray that God would strike us with blindness in our worldly eye and that we would see Jesus with just with our godly Christ-like eyes, with eyes of adoration that just want to praise him and thank him and have hearts filled with gratitude and thanksgiving that never end for what he's done for us and also for who he is. But the question again is, do you constantly pray and ask the Lord to strike you with blindness in your worldly eye, but also to strengthen your godly Christ-like eyes so you can see the world as God sees it? Now, the third question is, how exactly does the Lord want us to use these godly Christ-like eyes that he's given to us? He wants us to use them in a very special way. Now, just because you have godly Christ-like eyes doesn't mean that you're going to use them. doesn't mean that you're naturally going to see the world through your godly Christ-like eyes. In fact, naturally, we'll still use our worldly eyes. That's why they're called our natural eyes. Even though they're spiritual, the ones that we were born with, the minds and the hearts that we were born with. I mean, you can look at King Solomon. Remember King Solomon? The one thing that he asked for from the Lord were godly Christ-like eyes, a discerning heart, and to see the world as God sees it. So one thing he asked for, and he had those godly Christ-like eyes, but it's not what he used. He used his other eye. He used his other eye, his worldly eyes, to pursue achievements and honor and glory for himself and treasures for himself. And he had these wonderful palaces and homes for himself and even took from the poor for himself. And he had 700 wives and 300 girlfriends. And along with all these wives and all their these girlfriends from other nations, they brought all their idols, all their other gods. And we still have these 
idols, money, and other things, other powers. And he began to worship those things along with the one true and living God. And very sadly, unfortunately, because of Solomon, the nation of Israel, this great kingdom would never be the same. It would be divided in half. His own home was divided because of his sins and because of his idolatry, the idols and false gods that all of his wives and girlfriends brought into his life. And so that was the beginning of the end for the great nation of Israel. It would be divided and shattered from that point on. So the point, though, is just because you have godly Christ-like eyes, doesn't mean that you're naturally going to use them. doesn't mean that you're naturally going to see the world as, as God sees them. You can still use your worldly eyes and head down that path of unrighteousness, of, of worldliness. And so the question, though, is how does God want us to use our godly Christ-like eyes? Now, the answer to the question is he wants us to use our godly Christ-like eyes in order to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and in order to glorify him through with our obedience, with our obedience to his commands. I'll say that again. How does God want you to use your godly Christ-like eye? He wants you to use them ultimately to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ with your life by your obedience to him. With your godly Christ-like eyes, you're going to see the different circumstances and situations of your life in two different ways, and you have a choice to make. And usually the more difficult, more challenging way is the God-honoring, Christ-honoring way. But God wants us to use that wisdom and that discerning heart, those godly Christ-like eyes, in order to obey him because that's what gives glory to him. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, I think it's one of the most misunderstood verses out there. Uh, This is what it says. It says, set your minds on things above not on earthly things. Now, how do most people read this? What does it mean to most Christians, even? For most Christians, they read this like, okay, I'm going to set my mind not on earthly things here, but I'm going to set my mind on heavenly treasures for myself. I'm going to serve the Lord and do good things here, focusing on not on the gold and silver and things that I can earn this lifetime. I'm going to set it on those eternal rewards for me, but that's not what this verse is talking about. That's still very self-centered. That's really using our worldly eyes to see a spiritual reality. So what is God talking about? Set your mind on things above. It's a little bit of a mystery, but what God is talking about here is he's talking about Jesus. Set your mind with your godly Christ-like eyes on Jesus and on being obedient to him, on loving him, on adoring him and trusting in him, And also in glorifying him with all of your life and every single situation with your obedience to him. Even though in your flesh, with your worldly eyes, you want to do what is best for you. What feels good for you. I'm going to close this message and this message with a couple of stories where we can use our godly Christ-like eyes and also our worldly eyes as well. With a couple of people, a couple of, of men. And I want to share how you can see these men in two completely different ways. And they're also examples for us of how we can use our godly Christ-like eyes as well. So the first man is a man by the name of Harry Baxter Benenhoff. And he's so unknown. He's so unknown that you can't even find a picture of him, an image of him on the internet. I looked everywhere for a picture of Harry Baxter Benenhoff, but you can't even find There's No pictures of him anywhere on the internet. There's pictures of everyone. There's no pictures of Harry Baxter Benenhoff. But this man, Harry Baxter Benenhoff, he had the greatest potential when he was growing up. He went to a great university. He was known as being one of the most intelligent guys around. He could have been the CEO of a company or he could have been a governor, maybe president of the United States. But instead, instead, he just went to Japan in order to start this English club. For all the people over there at this one university, Waseda University, uh, who wanted to learn English in the 1930s, which was virtually uh, nobody at that time. And so this club was really small, but he wanted to use this club in order to share about Jesus and the gospel. And he did that his whole life. He really wanted to see this country that doesn't care anything about 
Jesus and still for the most part, even to this very day, even after his life's work, still for the most part doesn't care anything about Jesus, but he really wanted to see this nation to become a saved nation. But after his whole life's work, he came back to the United States and he passed away. Not that many people attended his funeral. And so many people look at Harry Baxter Benninghoff's life as being kind of just disappointing. He didn't live up to the potential that so many people, probably people in his family and his friends, hoped that he would live up to. He just, he just didn't. He didn't bring honor to his family by any worldly successes at all. Now there was this one man, another guy that I want to talk about, who was actually in that English-speaking club, a man by the name of Chuni Sugihara. And he was very similar to Harry Baxter Benninghoff because he also was extremely intelligent. Waseda University is their number two university. Many of them will tell you it's their Japan's number one university. It's like our Stanford here or Harvard here. Uh, and he also had so much potential. People thought that he would grow up and you know, be the CEO of a great company, or maybe he'd be the next prime minister. And he actually had a great career start. And so he was sent to Lithuania as an ambassador, an ambassador of Japan, which is a career of, of great honor, brings honor to the family. He was sent there as ambassador of Japan to Lithuania. He was sent there because he knew how to speak Russian and Japanese and English, a ton of different languages, sent there to be an ambassador he went there with the hopes maybe of being even greater than that someday. And World War II broke out and during that time he wrote thousands of visas so that people could become citizens of Japan or have part-time visas to Japan. And he did uh, you know, a lot of things, but eventually he was fired because the government found out that he was giving visas to some people that probably shouldn't receive visas. He was fired and he spent the rest of his life, in fact, in, in shame, in this shame-based culture. He was disgraced because he didn't fulfill his duties well. And so he spent the rest of his, his days there, actually in Japan, changing light bulbs. And then he passed away and not that many people attended his funeral. And it's the same thing with Harry Baxter Benninghoff. As we look at him with our worldly eyes, he was pretty much a disappointment to everyone around him, including his family. And he, by his uh, mistakes that he did in Lithuania, he actually caused a lot of harm to his children who also had to live basically in exile. Now that's one way of looking at Chiyune Sugihara with our worldly eyes. But if we look at him with our godly Christ-like eyes, we see a much different picture, a true picture of who he really was. It was during World War II that he was serving as an ambassador from Japan to Lithuania. And during this time, there were Jews from all over Lithuania and all over Europe who were looking for a way out. Nazi Germany had already slaughtered, already murdered millions of Jews, and they were about to murder many more. They were going to exterminate every single one of them. They had no place to run. There was no way to get out, no way to get away from the Nazi machine. Not even England or the United States was taking any of the Jews who were trying to escape. Sure, so there was even this one boat who got all the way to New York and the United States sent this boat back to Europe, back to Germany, only for each and every person on that boat, on that ship to be slaughtered and murdered by Nazi Germany. But Shuni Sugihara, he had a choice to make. He could actually give visas to as many Jews as he could who came to his office and there were so many who were lined up and he said that I can either obey my government, the Japanese government was an ally to Nazi Germany, he said I can either obey my government and reject all these people and not give them visas or, and this is what he said, he said, or I can be obedient to God and to his commands and I can save all these people from sure death. And he actually wrote 6,000 visas. And I want you to hear the story from uh, one of the sons of one of the survivors, one of the men who received a visa from Chuni Sugihara, who illegally and against the orders of the emperor and Japan, he actually gave um, over 6,000 visas, including 
to the father of this man here. And I want you to listen to this testimony directly from him. Time before Lithuania would become a place of blood and destruction at the hands of the Nazis, Yimach Shimon. But where to run? No country was exactly opening their arms to Jewish refugees, saying, Jews, you're welcome here. One day someone discovered a loophole involving the Dutch and Soviet councils that could grant the Jews in Lithuania safe passage. And this quite elaborate plan, however, had one contingency to it. The refugees would need to have an official Japanese visa in hand, a visa from the Japanese consulate. The Japanese consulate in Lithuania was a one-man operation administered by a very humble, understated individual named Chiyun Sugiara. When the notion of issuing Japanese visas to the Jewish refugees was presented to this diplomat, he had a decision to make. He knew that his government would be adamantly opposed to any issuing of visas to Jewish refugees. So for him, this would mean going against his ministry. This would mean that his career would be essentially over. This would mean that he and his family would be disgraced, perhaps indicted, and possibly executed. That's the decision he faced. He and his wife looked at the throngs of refugees, men, women, and children, and suddenly they knew there was no choice at all. In the words of Chiyun Sugihara, I may have to disobey my government, but if I don't, I would be disobeying God. I chose God over my government. From July 31st to August 28th, 1940, Chiyun Sugihara sat for hours, signing visas. Hour after hour, day after day, he wrote these visas with his own hands. Knowing that his days as the consulate were numbered, he didn't stop to eat, he hardly slept, his wife would feed him sandwiches as he continued to write, and when his hands would tire, she would massage his fingers and encourage him to go on. With each passing day, the lines of refugees in front of the Japanese consulate would get longer and longer, and Sugihara's writings would intensify. Eventually, his government got wind of his actions. They ordered him transferred to Berlin. But up to the very last minute, he didn't stop writing visas. Each visa represented a life, a human being. Even as his train was pulling out of the station, his body was arched out of the window of the train, still passing visas to Jewish refugees that followed him to the train station. The last action of Chin Sugihara as his train left the station was to take the actual stamp of the Japanese diplomat and toss it out the window so that a Jewish refugee can pick it up and attempt to forge additional visas. And so again, Shuni Sugihara was faced with this decision. He could either be executed or he could obey his government and allow all these people to be murdered. But his response, his response was, I could either obey my government or obey God, and I choose to obey God. And the amazing thing about that is that's not the way Japanese people talk. I mean, Japanese people aren't taught, they're not brought up to believe in a God. They're taught and brought up to believe that there is no creator God. And so it's a, such a strange thing, but he actually wrote over 6,000 visas. And what's amazing is that these 6,000, over 6,000 survivors today are over 60,000 people. The, the sons and daughters and their sons and daughters today are over 60,000 people. That's more people that can actually fit in Angel Stadium. That's like three times Crypto Stadium. It's a ton of people. And they all have uh, Chune Sugihara to thank because he gave them visas, but he sacrificed not just his, willing to sacrifice not just his life to live in exile and to live in shame, but he also sacrificed his whole family. His children had to suffer. They had to live in exile and in shame as well, but he was willing to do that in order to be obedient to God, to love on his neighbor and to share the same love of Christ. And Today, you can go to Israel, and I've gone to Israel and seen his tree. In Israel, there's this garden that's dedicated to the righteous, to all the Gentiles of the world who helped Jews during World War II. 
And so next to Oscar, close to Oscar Schindler's tree, Oscar Schindler, uh, there was a movie about him, well-known, saved over 500 Jews. Close to his tree is Chuni Sugihara's tree, who saved over 6,000 individuals, 6,000 Jews. But the question is, where did Chuni Sugihara get these godly Christ-like eyes, these eyes that are willing to sacrifice of his life and his family's life even, in order to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, in order to do God's will. Where did he get these eyes? Well, that brings us back to our first guy, Harry Baxter Benenhoff, this very humble man who seemingly, in a worldly sense, didn't do anything. He started an English club. But that's where, as a Baptist minister, and we know Baptist missionaries and ministers, every single time you talk to them, they'll share the gospel with you. That's where he heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. He heard the gospel, gave his life to Christ. People don't know about this, but that's where he got those godly Christ-like eyes that really uh, impelled him to say, I choose God even over my beloved government. I choose to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and God more than my government. I'm willing to sacrifice my life in order to help these people for the Lord's sake and for his name. He was one of the students in Harry Baxter Benninghoff's English club, where they not only learn how to speak English, but they also learn the gospel and learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. But the question for us today is, which path will you choose? And which eye will you choose to use? Each and every day, the Lord tests us, not just in these great ways, these grand ways, but he will also test you and also test us each and every day in every different circumstance, and he asks us the question, which eye are you going to use to look at this situation? And which path are you going, going to go down? He tests us every single day. The question is sometimes simple. Which eye are you going to use? Are you going to worship me? Or are you going to spend your life or your Sundays in the flesh, having fun in the flesh? Are you going to raise children who just love me? and love my word, and it's very simple, and love the kingdom, or are you going to try to raise children who are successful in the world's eyes, and who also bring honor to you and to your family? Are you going to share the gospel and be willing to be persecuted and hated, or are you going to just strive to be liked in your life? Are you going to share what is right and wrong from scripture, and it's very unpopular today, it's very countercultural and anti-cultural today? Or are you just going to go through your life, your whole life, and be quiet and allow the culture to continue to go downhill just to be liked? What are you going to do? The Lord asks us that question in every circumstance of our life, and that is a question that he poses to us today. Which eye are you going to choose? Will you pray with me? Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for these godly Christ-like eyes, your eyes that you have given to us. And we pray, our hope and our prayer, Father, is that we would be obedient to you so that we would glorify Christ and that we'd be obedient out of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. He had that same choice, whether to seek his own personal fleshly will on earth and to not suffer punishment for us or to be obedient, to seek your will. And Lord, we know that for your glory, Lord, that he chose to be obedient to you and to suffer, even more so than to save us. We, he did that, Lord, in order to glorify you. And so we pray that we would have that same spirit and have that same will. Lord, that we would have that same obedience, that we would choose to use our godly Christ-like eyes in order to glorify him, to be obedient to him, out of gratitude for what he has done for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.